So I wanted to make a quick video going over the graphs of polar equations. Now this is not going to be a very in-depth video because since we are just getting started with polar coordinates and polar equations, I don't really want to go too in-depth right now. You will be going more in-depth in this in your calculus classes, so it's good for you to have a good understanding of the basics of it for right now. We're going to be discussing two main things. One is the actual shape of the graph of the polar equation, and the second is going to be the symmetry of that graph. So let's start off by symmetry. Not paying attention to what the graph actually looks like, there are three types of symmetry that we could have. The x-axis, which could also be referred to as the polar axis. The x-axis, or it can also be referred to as the line of theta is equal to pi over 2. And we can also have symmetry by the origin or the pole. So symmetrical by the polar axis or the x-axis simply means that it's being reflected across this line right here, this x-axis. So if we were to fold this paper, both of these points would match up exactly. The y-axis, once again, same deal. If you were to fold along this line, these two points would match up exactly. But the origin or the pole is a little bit different. This one means that if you were to take this paper and you were to turn it upside down, basically flip it 180 degrees, you would get this point at the point where this one used to be. So how do we actually test for symmetry? It depends on what kind of symmetry we're testing for. So each one of our polar coordinates is going to have both r and theta. And what we're going to do is we're going to replace r and theta with one of these two sets of r and theta. We'll call this r prime and theta prime. And by doing this, we will be able to tell whether they're symmetric if and only if when we replace with either one of these, it gives us the same answer as the original. So let's go ahead and show you what I'm talking about. Now, I apologize for this Q. This is supposed to mean theta. I don't know what happened with the file that it didn't transfer over correctly. But for right now, this Q that you see right here, we're just going to take that to mean theta. So the first one is saying, use the symmetry test to prove that the graph of R is equal to 2 times the sine of 2 theta is symmetric about the y-axis. So again, that is also the line theta is equal to pi over 2. That's two different ways to, see, to, to say that. And all we do is we take my original equation, r is equal to 2 times the sine of 2 times theta, and we replace it with either, since we're testing for the y-axis, either negative r and negative theta, or r and pi minus theta. So the simple one is going to be this one. So let's just go ahead and do it. Negative r is equal to 2 times the sine of 2 times negative theta. And basically we want to know whether these two are equivalent to one another. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and simplify this by factoring out the negative and then factoring out one more time and we end up with r is equal to 2 times the sine of negative 2 times theta. Then, like I said, we factor it out a second time, and we end up with, we'll go out here, negative r is equal to negative 2 times the sine of 2 times theta. And if we were to divide by negative 1 on both sides, both negatives would cancel out, and I would get r is equal to 2 times the sine of 2 times theta, which is my original the equation and so we know that this is actually symmetrical by the y-axis. Now that's how you test for symmetry and there's going to be a couple of problems like that but honestly the problems that I'm going to give you right now are going to be all graph based. In other words you're going to have to look at a graph. Let's draw something like a heart for example and I know this isn't perfect but you would just say hey is this symmetrical by the y-axis or the x-axis. It would not be symmetrical by the x-axis here and it would be symmetrical about the origin and from there you're going to be able to figure out and we'll look at a few examples at the end of the video. Um, rose, rose curves and Limousin curves are going to be two of the main types of graphs that we are going to look at so I wanted to cover those very very quickly. Now rose curves are pretty cool. Um, they're named rose curves because of the petals that they have. These Each, each of these loops are, are actually called petals and so they're named rose curves because they look like flowers. And there's two types of rose curves you can have. Uh, one is going to be derived from an equation with cosine in it, and one is going to be derived with an equation 
where, where sine is units. Now, the main difference between the two, actually, let me go ahead and graph them. So as you can see here, I have graphed both a cosine Rho's curve and a sine Rho's curve. Now, let's take a look at the cosine Rho's curve. You will see that the cosine Rho's curve, and remember, we always associate cosine with x, actually falls on the x-axis. And then the sine Rho's curve falls on the y-axis. So that's the main difference between using sine and cosine. Now, this number right here is going to tell you the amount of petals, and any number that you add in front of the cosine, for example, let's say 4, is going to determine the length of the petal. So notice how this actually goes out to 4. And so from here to the pole or to the center to the origin, it would be a distance of 4 units. In other words, if we have a times the cosine of n theta, a represents, a represents the size of the petal. And n represents the number of petals. So there, there is going to be another key point to this. And it's this part right here. If n is odd, there are n petals. And if n is even, there are two n petals. So that means that anytime we have an even number as our n, we're going to double the amount of petals. And for n being odd, we're just going to leave it as is. So for example, if I had... 4, then we would have to double the amount of petals, and it would give us 8 petals. But 5 brings it back down to 5 without doubling the amount of petals. So Rho's curves are not very complicated, um, at least the basics of it. And you can actually see some sort of symmetry from it. So if we look at this one, cosine is symmetrical by the, uh, again, we call this the polar axis or the x-axis. And then we can see that the graph of sine is going to be symmetrical by the y-axis or the line of, of pi over 2. And the reason we call it pi over 2 is, um, well, if we change this to radians, we know that this line is pi over 2. So um, this would be the axis, right, because of, of, of the radians. You could also say the, the line of 90 degrees if, if you'd like. Now, this was another mistake where it wasn't copied over correctly, but... These are called Limousin curves. Now it is, it does have a little fancy C <laughs> that makes an S sound. So um, you can go ahead and refer to these as Limousins. And, um, and these curves are pretty interesting. They look like a circle with a, um, well, they call it different things. They either call it an inner loop, uh, a dimple, um, but, but, but we'll, we'll end up calling this a little loop. So the graph for these is going to be r is equal to a plus or minus b times the sine of theta, or the same thing, but with the cosine of theta. So based off what we discussed with uh, Rho's curves, what do you think the difference between the sine and the cosine will be? Well, if you're not sure, let's go ahead and graph these. Now, for these to be Limousin curves, we're going to need to go ahead and make sure that we're adding these. So notice the difference. Cosine is going to land more heavily on the polar axis, and the sine is going to land more heavily on the y-axis. So that's the main difference between sine and cosine. Now, these numbers are actually going to play a big part into what the, what the actual curve is going to look like. Notice how... When I went from 4 to 1, the loop was more pronounced and the circle got smaller. So this chart actually gives us a little bit of insight as to what is going on between A and B to make that loop more or less pronounced. So right here we have a limousine with an inner loop of if we have A and we divide it by B and that is less than 1, then we have a very pronounced loop and of course the smaller or or, or the closer to zero that that is, the, the more that loop is going to be pronounced. A cardoid, it kind of looks like if it has a little heart, it's where it, where it has a really sharp edge going in. And that's going to happen if A divided by B are exactly one. So if we go back to our graph, right? If I'm going to divide A and B, 
So that would be something like that. It has a very pronounced loop. Now, if we make this bigger, it's going to have a bigger inner loop. And if we make this smaller, for example, we'll make this three and we'll make this two. So this is called a dimpled limosome because we don't have a very sharp pronounced edge. So it's not exactly equal to one. Again, if this were three and three, have a dimpled, sorry, this, this would be a cardioid. And then if we have something between one and two, then this would go ahead and just be a bit of a dimple. Now, if we have something that's exactly two, sorry, only 1.5. Then we have what we call a com convex limosome. And that basically means that it's got a flat edge right here. So it's gonna be important for us to know which kind of limosome we're working with. And by simply taking A and dividing it by B, we're gonna be able to tell kind of what the graph is gonna look like. Now, some of the questions that they may ask you are, show the graphs of R is equal to four plus three times the cosine of theta, and R is equal to negative four plus three times the cosine of theta. And they want to know whether these are the same limosomes or not. And what we can actually go ahead and do is we can actually graph both of them. So we have r is equal to 4 plus 3 times the cosine of theta. And r is equal to negative 4 plus 3 times the cosine of theta. And so as you can see from this, both of them are actually exactly the same. And so now that you see that they're the same shape, you can go ahead and answer your question that yes, they are. But let's let's take for example that this is the limosome that we graphed. Uh, there is actually a difference, and the difference is that while the positive one is going to move in the positive direction, that's that first one right here, this one is going to form the same shape but by moving in the negative direction, since what they did is they ended up factoring out a negative from all of this, and that's why we ended up getting the same shape but it's actually two different graphs. They are moving in different directions. Now, other polar equations that we're not going to really get too deep into, but that it's good for you guys to know, is the spiral of Archimedes. And this one has r is equal to theta, and it's just simply a spiral. And of course, you can change the number in front of the theta, so it can be something like r is equal to 4 times theta or anything like that. Then we see that we end up with a spiral. Now, lemniscate gate curve is what some of you may recognize as the infinity symbol. Um, others of you may uh, see this and think, oh, maybe that's a rose curve, but it's actually not. And the reason for that is because there is no way for a, ro for a rose curve to have two petals. Because when you think about it, if you go back to r is equal to a times, let's say, the cosine of theta, right, of n times theta, um, there is no way to get this n to give you two petals, because if you put in r is equal to, let's just say, cosine times 2 theta, this is going to have four petals, because remember that when n is even, it doubles. So the only way to get a lemniscate, to get an infinity symbol, is to use squared. So notice how this is r squared is equal to a squared sine times 2 times theta. So let's go ahead and try to graph it. Now I think Desmos might actually let me graph a, a lemniscate, no problem, but let's see. 1 times, let's say the cosine of 2 times theta. And see, it actually won't let me graph it, but there is a way around this. If instead we square root both sides, there we go. It actually allows me to graph the lemniscate, gate, no problem. So before you try to input this into your calculator, go ahead and make sure that you get rid of that squared by taking the square root of both sides. And then you should have a problem.
Now these problems are multiple choice and I just wanted to go ahead and uh, give you guys a couple of practice problems where you could s sort of s see exactly what's going on. Now, now you can uh, obviously graph these using decimals, um, but let's go ahead and try to, to figure these out on our own. So first of all, consider each polar equation and classify the curve and sketch the graph. So um, each one of these calls it a limit skate, so that's correct. Now, the key thing is going to be that 36. So that 36 is going to give us some insight as to how far these pedals have to stretch. Now, if you're not sure, you can go ahead and graph it. But I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now that once you find out the trick, you're going to be able to do these without graphing. So let's graph this. And since we already have this one pulled up, we'll just go ahead and add a 36 in there. And I want you guys to notice to what outer circle this stretched out to. 6. And the reason for that is because the square root of 36 is 6. So when we go back here, you can see that, well, which one of these stretches out to exactly 6? This one right here. Now, here we have a very similar situation. Um, we have a is equal to 6 and b is equal to 1 and we have 6 over 1 is going to be the the value that determines what kind of uh, uh, loop we have. We know it's not going to be a loop. We know it's not going to be a cardoid. And so it's going to be some sort of convex limousin. Um And the reason we know this is because remember loop has to be less than 1 uh, for your a divided by b. And cardoid has to be a divided by b is equal to exactly 1. So it has to be a type of convex. Now, these two convexes are similar but different in the sense that this one extends all the way out to 4 and this one extends a little bit past 6. That could be 7 right there. So let's actually go ahead and try to graph it and see which one we get. So we get r is equal to 6 plus the cosine of theta. And as you can see, this one actually stands out a little bit past 6. Now, another thing that you could do is you could actually measure um, where it intercepts your y-axis. So I want you guys to notice this, that from here to here is actually 6, and from here to here is actually 6. So that's another little quick trick for, for you to know um, where exactly your convex, sorry, where exactly your uh, limos ones are going to cross. I'm going to go ahead and leave the rest of these to you. Uh, by simply using a graphing calculator, you should be able to figure out most of them. Um, but now, we can actually go ahead and go through these. So now we're asking to determine whether the graph is symmetric with respect to the origin, polar axis, um, and the line uh, pi over 2. So remember, origin is upside down, polar axis is x-axis, and pi over 2 is just the y-axis. So uh, this one, we could say that it is symmetrical by the y-axis. Um, it doesn't look like if we turned it around, it would be symmetrical, and it's definitely not symmetrical by the x-axis. This one's a special case. I think it's all of the above, right? Because if you flipped it upside down, it would look exactly the same. It's being split in half by the y, and it's being split in half by the x. So this one's definitely all of the above.